Very good. Okay, welcome. A, a special welcome to, of course, um, Robert Skidelsky, our honored speaker of today. Uh, a special welcome to Johan Muiske, um, whose name is connected to this, uh, this lecture series. A special welcome to the, to the Dean of the School of Business and Economics. And of course, also welcome to everybody who is watching this on the live stream. My name is Clemens Kohl, and I hold the chair in Macroeconomics and International Monetary Economics here at the School of Economics and Business. At the si same time, I'm head of the Department of Macro, International and Labor Economics, which was the uh, host and the home of Johan Muiske in the years that he worked here. It's my pleasure to be your host tonight uh, on the occasion of the sixth Johan Muiske lecture. The aim of this yearly event is to honor his work because he played a key role in the building of our school as a professor, the first professor appointed here, but also as a head of department and dean. Johan combines deep theoretical insights with applied research, and he has a keen eye for the resulting policy implications. And perhaps even more importantly for tonight, he has a strong preference for let's say, non-orthodox, non-mainstream economic thinking. And when we initiated this annual lecture as a tribute to him at the occasion of his retirement, um, we actually tried to continue this way of thinking, this broad approach to economics. It's a special night today, not only uh, because of this sixth uh, Joe Muiske lecture, but also because it's special uh, as last year we had to cancel due to the COVID-19 lockdown. And being back and seeing everybody again here, even if everybody uh, present here had to pass a few extra hurdles, is great. So great that you took the opportunity to come here tonight uh, with face masks, but of course now you can put them off. So welcome. This lecture will be delivered by Robert Skidelsky. He is a world famous economist who perfectly fits the bill of our series. Um, before I want to introduce him more uh, in detail, I would like to extend special thanks, first to Studium Generale, who, and his representative, Jaap uh, Janssen, because they are the highly appreciated co-organizer of this lecture series. And I want to give special thanks to my colleagues, Tom van Veen and Silvana de Sanctis, who did a lot of work to make this lecture possible. So let's turn to our guest of tonight, Robert Skidelsky. He's a British economic historian of Russian origin. He started his academic career some time ago, the 60s, at Nuffield College in Oxford. But after some short stays, amongst others at John, John Hopkins University, he joined the University of Warwick in 1978 as a professor of international studies, where he has remained since though joining at some point the economics department as professor of political economy. And currently, he is emeritus professor of political economy at Warwick. He is widely, I would say, globally known as the leading expert on the work and thoughts of John Maynard Keynes. And his three volume biography of Keynes is considered the definite account of the life and work of this influential British economist. And the trilogy got a lot of awards, including the Lionel Goldberg Prize for International Relations and the Council on Foreign Relations Prize for International Relations. But Robert has not only written on Keynes directly, when the recent global financial crisis hit in 2007-2008, he again wrote a seminal and very influenci influential book, Keynes, The Return of the Master, to provide his perspective on the causes and consequences of failed capitalism. More generally, he has published widely on topics of societal relevance, and that includes the topic of this evening. I would say the two most telling characteristics, uh, characteristics of Robert Skidelsky are his intellectual independence and his drive to improve the world. And both show in his involvement in politics. So he is not an ivory tower academic, not at all. He has been a member of three political parties. If I'm correct, he started out as a Labour Party member, then he left the party to become a founding member of the Social Democratic Party, where he re remained until the party's dissolution in 92, 
And in 92, he became a conservative. He became chief opposition spokesman in the Lords, first for culture, then for treasury. And then he was removed by the conservative party leaders. And at some point, he left the conservative party to start in the cross benches as an independent. I would say that proves a lot of both societal impact and political and intellectual independence. <laughs> this independence and also his drive shows in the fact that he is chairman of the Center of Global Studies. And I looked at their website. It's an independent think tank that works from the principle that the only aim of economics is to improve lives. And it looks at questions of political economy from the perspective that economic orthodoxy is irrelevant if it fails to do so, so if it fails to improve lives of everybody. Now, in this spirit, I'm very proud and happy today that I can announce that Professor Skidelsky will give a lecture on the human condition in the age of machines. The lecture will take close to one hour. We have not pinned it down very exactly. We'll see where we go. Afterwards, there will be an uh, opportunity for questions, so write down any questions that, is that come up uh, during the lecture. I will try to moderate the questions and some of us will walk around with microphones so that whatever you want to ask is also heard here at the front. After that, there will be informal drinks. Professor Skidelsky, we're happy to have you here in Maastricht. We look forward to your lecture. The floor is yours. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Um, I'm very glad to be here. Um, I, I know uh, this, uh, I mean, Maastricht is famous for, for many, many, many things, much more important than the Maastricht Treaty. Um, but um, it's my first visit, and uh, I'm delighted to be here. And thank you very much for those uh, kind words. Um, I'm going to talk about the human condition in the, in the age of machines. It's a book I've been working on. Um, I have, uh, I have um, finished it, um, but um, I've had problems with the last chapter, uh, and I hope you'll help me uh, by your questions and comments. Um, but um, let's start by saying that artificial intelligence systems, job automation, social media scandals, terrorism, digital Taylorism, climate change, have all come rushing in on us in a giant, I'd say, clusterfuck. I mean, that's a word I learned recently, but I find it so extraordinarily expressive that I couldn't uh, help, I couldn't uh, resist the temptation to use it. But that's the background of this lecture um, and, uh, and whose meaning and importance uh, for the human future. I hope to sort out in, in my book. Well, let me um, introduce the subject as follows. In the past, humans used machines, but didn't live in a machine age. Their conditions of life changed very slowly over thousands of years. But today, we depend on machines for the way we work, the way we think, the way we live. And this raises three questions. How and why has the age of machines come about? What effect has it had on the human condition? And what influence have we got over what happens to ourselves and machines in the future? And the book's taken a long time uh, to uh, germinate. Um, and its, it's, its seed was really planted in a book I wrote with my son um, in 2009, 2000 actually 2012, called How Much is Enough. It was, I think, published in, certainly published in German. I don't know whether it was published in, in, in Dutch. And my own um, inspiration for that book was a short essay by John Maynard Keynes called Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren. And that came out in 1930. Um, and in that, he, he predicted that machines would remove the need for people to work so hard, and therefore inaugurating a post-capitalist age of abundance. Um, and Marx, Karl Marx, had much the same idea, actually. Well, 
I, I went on writing about this, but other things intervened. I wrote a short book on the return of the master, as been mentioned. Money and Government was a longer book, and um, What's Wrong with Economics was my last book, which was published uh, a year ago. And so continuous work on my machine book really started um, uh, during the COVID lockdown when I had the time to do it. Well, my thoughts on how to do it. I started with the idea of writing about what I could call the automation discourse. That is an investigation of what machines have meant for the world of work, the automation discourse. In this course, in this discourse, machinery simply makes work more productive. And that shortens the time needed to earn a living, and the shorter the working day, the more time there is for the pursuits of other things, the good things of life, what Keynes talked about, um, living wisely, agreeably, and well. That's that optimistic view. Set against this has been a continuous fear um, of redundancy, lo loss of skills, identity, and position associated with work, together with um, the loss of income. Uh, and, and this is a lively and continuous discourse. It, it goes on and on, and, and, and you know, I'll say a bit more about it later on, but these two positions, that it opens up an era of abundance, um, abundance and leisure, and or that it leads to unemployment and misery and poverty, these two positions have um, fought each other for the last 200 years, ever since the Industrial Revolution, really. Now, this automation discourse, as I call it, has huge ramifications uh, outside the workplace. Machine production in the workplace didn't just release a block of time called leisure, it speeded up our consumption of goods. It speeded up our consumption of natural resources. It shaped the condition of leisures in all kinds of ways. Urban landscapes of houses, shops, utilities, grew up around workplaces. Our urban culture is the direct result of using machines in factories. Uh, together with systems for distributing goods and people and entertaining them, communicating news, a whole, a whole lot of things followed from the introduction of machinery in, in, to make things. With greater variety of goods and services, new markets for them had to be secured by advertising, the world economy grew, and these were all the consequences of using machines for producing goods. However, however, there's another discourse which runs parallel to the automation discourse. And <clears throat> that has been the use of machinery deliberately to reshape and improve human behavior, to make society function with the precision of a machine. I call this the perfectibility discourse. You could call it the perfection discourse. Let's say the perfectibility discourse. And, and I follow the lead there of someone um, called John Passmore, who wrote exactly about this. And the perfectibility discourse has a long ancestry, starting with Plato, but in its modern iteration, it comes with the rise of science and the decline of religion, and therefore the growth of a mechanistic view of life, and with that, the idea that life could be perfected, made frictionless, like a perfect machine. And so, Factory machinery morphed into social machinery. Engineering became social engineering. So that's a parallel um, discourse. Because the factory system wasn't just about machines helping humans churn out goods. It was about adjusting the flexible lives of humans to the logic of the machines. And that, of course, happened in the factories themselves. Um, so there was no reason in principle, once you accept that 
in a, in a factory system, humans are subordinate to the logic of mach the machines that have been installed. They have to work to the time of the machine. They have to do what the machines want them to do, or what their controllers want them to do. No reason in principle why machines shouldn't be applied to controlling humans outside the factory as soon as the engineering, social, and behavioral sciences were up to the job. Couldn't machines be envisaged as part of an omniscient planning system into which humans, too, could be slotted to their great benefit? The way was open to producing not just goods, but happiness. <coughs> and all that was a dream for many, many years. Um, you know, you couldn't do it. But digital technology has now brought it closer uh, to fulfillment. Again, analysts of the latest developments in digital technology are divided into optimists and pessimists. The optimists argue that information technology, with the starting with the inv invention of printing, really, frees individuals from the authority of priests and despots. Pessimists point to the enhanced opportunities for control it gives Big Brother. Much of this debate has come to center on the nature of the social media. Do they enlarge individual freedom or do they multiply opportunities for planting and spreading fake news? Or what if they do both together? Thus, the automation discourse concerned with making work more efficient merged in my mind with the perfectibility discourse concerned with making life more efficient. And so those are the two strands, really, of the book. Now, analytic and imaginative thinkers have um, envisaged three possible routes to the future in the age of machines. Arnold Toynbee stressed the positive effect of having machines do the routine tasks of life. And I quote, technology a transfer of energy from some lower sphere of being to some action in a higher sphere. It was the transfer of energy from the lower to the higher that he thought of as the great promise of machines. Um, he's in a long line of optimistic thinkers, um, which includes Karl Marx, John Stuart Mill, Bertrand Russell, and John Maynard Keynes. By the way, am I supposed to be seeing myself on this? because if I am, I'm not. No, it's all right? Fine. Um, <coughs> and all of those thinkers, Marx, Mill, Russell, Keynes, um, have looked forward to a machine-driven evolution of humans to, a high, to higher forms of life. And the dream of improving the conditions of human existence is still strong in the scientific community and sections of politics, despite the blows inflicted by the disasters of the 20th century. Um, and that dream of improving or perfecting humans has been given, was given new impetus and urgency by the development of artificial, um, uh, artificial intelligence. And urgency by, you know, the warnings of ecological disaster, um, if we don't raise the human performance to a higher level, not only ecological disaster, but also disasters connected with weaponry um, and uh, industry, yes, and, 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 and nuclear, and nuclear, um, nuclear energy. Now, that's the first future, that it frees us to realize our higher potential, as machines do. Now, a second projected future is dystopian. As envisaged by Aldous Huxley in his novel Brave New World, the criminality and rebelliousness of humans will be ironed out of them by chemical and psychological treatment with a drug he called Soma. This is also, by the way, the theme of Stan Kubrick's film A Clockwork Orange. Um, Huxley writes, there will be, in the next generation or so, and he's writing, I mean, the, uh, um, uh, the uh, Brave New World dates from the late 1930s. There will be, in the next generation or so, a pharmacological method of making people love their servitude 
and producing dictatorship without tears, so to speak, a kind of painless concentration camp for entire societies so that people will in fact have their liberties taken away from them but still rather enjoy it because they will be distracted from any desire to rebel by propaganda or brainwashing or brainwashing enhanced by chemical methods and this seems to be the final revolution. So that was the vision of the brave new world. The third future is apocalyptic. It envisages a technical, technological meltdown of some kind. Either the technology brings about a disaster, an, 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 a, a nuclear or, or ecological a holocaust, <clears throat> or it stops working, leaving uh, humanity um, without the means of livelihood. Both these visions, uh, versions of dystopian prophecy, imply the destruction of a large part of the human population and the reversion of the survivors to more primitive conditions of life. Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, a modern Prometheus, is a prefigurement of technology run out of control. It came out at the beginning of the 19th century. But there's another version, E.M. Forster's, very interesting, The Machine Stops, is a prefigurement of what happens when the system of machinery on which we have come to depend stops working uh, because of technical glitches, let's say. And evidently the two meltdowns can be combined. There have been lots of things called outings already, incidents of outings, when machines stop working in local areas. You know, the electricity supply is cut off for hours at a time, um, things like that. Now, Forster thinks, what happens if that happens to the whole of the system of computers, connected computers? He, he, of course, he was writing in 1910, um, when there weren't any computers, but still he had the imagination to think of a basically of an interconnected system of machines which controlled all aspects of human living, but it then stopped working. So what would humans do? However, there's a further strand of thinking about the human future, which is to renounce machinery or the project of social engineering altogether. And here I want to quote from Dostoevsky's notes from the underground, um, notes that were sprung from a, the 19th century fusion of religion and romanticism. And they open up a quite different way of thinking about the future of the relationship between humans and machines. So Dostoevsky's narrator, to the claims of the technician, he, this is really Dostoevsky speaking. You want to cure men of their old habits and reform their will in accordance with science and good sense. But how do you know, not only that it's possible, but that it is desirable to reform men in that way? And what leads you to the conclusion that man's inclinations need reforming? In short, how do you know, how do you know uh, that such a reformation will be of benefit to humanity. It may be the law of logic, but it is not the law of humanity. And Dostoevsky invites the question, why is it necessary that humans should exist at all? <clears throat> now, my own attitude to machines has shifted, uh, has been shifted by the effort of thought required to write this book as well as by some dystopian personal experiences with machinery, which I attribute to age, but uh, of course I generalize as being a general, you know, general problem. Um, <clears throat> I started off very much in the Keynes camp. Machines would lighten the burden of toil, liberate the human spirit, solve the class war, bring about an age of abundance and leisure, that utopia. Uh, the main issue then in that sort of if you take that view, is simply a question of distribution. You've got your abundance, you have to distribute it. It becomes a question of social ju justice. Then it becomes an issue of democratic politics um, and so on. Um, and elements of this dream, by the way, seemed on the point of being realized in the 1960s, which was the heyday of social democracy. But then I became increasingly dissatisfied with this discourse for two main reasons. 
First, because it seemed to me that the economist's idea of work as sadness, work as sadness, or work as curse, or, to put it in technical language, work as cost, ignored or seriously underestimated the emotional importance of work, paid, rewarded, appreciated work in sustaining the individual's identity and sense of self-worth, uh, as well as commu communal ties with his fellows. Work, for better or worse, is part of the human condition. It doesn't have to be working 10 hours a day or 20 hours a day, but work in, is part of the human condition. Humans are not naturally idle people. They never have been. So economists, they skewed the discussion by talking about work as a cost, which of course means that if you don't have to make work, you're you know, blissfully happy. But that's actually completely unrealistic. Um, but the um, automation discourse, the one I'm, I'm sort of uh, uh, talking about at the moment, has also been blind to the totalitarian danger of treating human beings like bits. Um, long before Frederick Winslow Taylor uh, developed his principles uh, for the scientific management of factory work, um, and this was, uh, 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 he did that early in the 19th century, Jeremy Bentham, in 18, the 1820s, had devised his panopticon, a circular, uh, uh, a circular prison with cells arranged round a central tower from which, at all times, prisoners could be observed by a single security guard. What a saving of labor and what an increase in control. You know, concentration camps have all been built on that principle ever since. But Bentham thought the plan equally applicable and relevant to hospitals and schools. Um, Orwell's big brother, in his uh, novel 1984, carries this thought to its logical extreme by having a two-way screen in every flat or apartment. And today's CCTV cameras build face and voice recognition systems into this ancient technology. We can do much better than Bentham's panopticon. <clears throat> so let me now briefly outline the two main elements of the of, of, of the main elements of the two discourses I refer to: the automation discourse first, and then the per, uh, perf uh, perfectibility discourse. So, what is what is the you know what are the job losses we can expect from technology? In nineteen in 2017, McKinsey Global Institute published a report called Jobs Lost, Jobs Gained, in which they claimed that 50% of working hours in the global economy could theoretically be automated. 50%. However, they suggested that, that the proportion was not likely to exceed 30%. And in fact, as the midpoint between two different estimates, the report settled on a prediction of 50%, 15%. 15 all jobs in the world economy could be automated now. Uh, then they estimated that only 5% of these 15 could be fully automated, uh, but that in 60% of occupations, at least 30% of the work required could be. In other words, they were, <coughs> their model was one not of substitution, but of complementarity. Um, even allowing that, and uh, 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 making allowances for all these things, that does leave about 250 million jobs globally now, at this moment, or in 2017, capable of being automated. That is quite a large number. And most of them will be in, in the developed world. <clears throat> um, well, so what do they make of this? They, well, this is the way the discourse goes. I mean, I'm afraid you've probably heard it all before. It's very boring but it, it, because it's endlessly repeated. McKinsey claims that although there will be no less net loss of jobs in the long run, these jobs will be replaced and somehow, there will be transitions. 
And these transitions may include periods of higher unemployment and wage adjustments. When you, know, when you talk about wage adjustments, be sure it's wage adjustments downwards. Um, it all depends, they say, on the rate at which displaced workers are re-employed. A low re-employment rate will lead to a higher medium-term unemployment rate uh, and, and vice versa. And so how do they propose to mitigate the costs of adju adjustment? Education. That's, that's the black box. Education. Um, and you, education, retraining, upskilling, reskilling, more university places, more vocational places, more job, government job training schemes, all the whole, the whole um, artillery of, 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 of adjustment is then deployed in order to mitigate the costs of the transition, which, which, they say, um, may be measured in decades, decades, not years. So that's the prospect. Everything will be all right in the end. It'll be great. And in fact, history has shown this to be so. But it may take decades. How many decades, they don't say. Um, but I'm quoting. Well, so what the problem then is, apart from all this wonderful retraining and upskilling, which we're promised, um, is uh, we have to maintain incomes during the transition, don't we? And, and to ensure that permanent job losses don't lead to the impoverishment of these 250 million people and the many more that uh, will, will follow. And so you have lots of schemes for doing this. One of the most interesting, by the way, is universal basic income, which uh, would give citizens a state stipend independent of the labor market. And there have been trials of this in, in, in different countries, and I'm not against it. I think if you're going down this route, it's something you need to consider very carefully. Um, and then we have the more orthodox redistributionary schemes um, of, the, of, of, of parties of the left to, to ensure that the fruits of technical progress are shared more equally and don't just accrue as profits um, to, to business. <coughs> so that's roughly the state of the argument today. But it's not static, because as technology improves, more and more um, people will be made redundant who are now working in routine jobs and research jobs and in low-paid, precarious jobs like shelf fillers. In other words, more back office work will be handed over to software tools. Voice recognition systems will remove the need for knowing foreign languages, for example, and therefore translating them. Nor indeed will there be any need for drivers or pilots as driverless cars and, 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 and lorries take control of roads, rails, and skies. Nor will there be any need for human cashiers in supermarkets. They've already gone, most of them. The time for bringing new medicines to market will be cut from years to months to days as computers equipped with big data take over their testing, thus removing layers of human technicians from the medical profession. Some human tasks, of course, will survive. Um, uh, business models of the future leave place for energized uh, strategic cadres of people working alongside chief executives to direct the labors of thousands of machines. Jobs involving manual or human dexterity like bartenders may well survive since robots are not good at pouring drinks and there's no real way people have yet worked out how this defect might be remedied. And there are lots of new jobs available uh, uh, which will come um, into existence in the caring sector as the population ages and growing percentage thereby become less healthy. <clears throat> well, then, so, what do we say? This polarized debate does scant justice to the many reasons why people have worked throughout history. And it's also... Um, heavily gender biased. After the Industrial Revolution, men replaced women as the family breadwinner. Women's work became in increasingly invisible homework. 
And until recently, women's participation in the labor market was considered secondary to marriage and child rearing. And so the results of automation, good or bad, have mainly been discussed in relation to men. So I felt, you know, that the discussion was unsatisfactory from that point of view too. Uh, so, you know, the debate goes on and on, but I'm going to, I've said, about, I've said enough about this, and I'm actually a bit more interested in the second part of, um, of uh, my, my um, talk, which is the, the perfectibility discourse. Um, as I said, this started with Plato and his picture of an ideal society ruled by philosopher kings. Not philosopher queens, philosopher kings. Cutting across it was the Augustinian Christian um, uh, religion, which ruled out the possibility of perfection in this life. But the perfectibility discourse picked up again um, in the, during the Renaissance and, and the Enlightenment. Um, a key indicator of its revival was Thomas More's Utopia in 1516, it was the first of many utopian novels. It's odd to call it a novel, let's say stories. A common feature of all these utopian stories, and we've had many of them since Thomas More, has been not so much work, some work, but not so much work, a communistic sharing of goods, and rule by benevolent leaders, let's say benevolent despots. They've all had those sort of features. You know, the Soviet Union was one inc incarnation of a Thomas More ideal. Um, and the philosophic, the philosophic impetus behind these ideas, and I think this is very important to understand, was to straighten the crooked timber of humanity, straighten the crooked wood out of which humans are made, so as to avoid the crimes, follies, and misfortunes which have hitherto dominated history. That was the idea. Why are bananas bent? Albert Hirschman once asked. Why are bananas bent? Because no one went into the jungle to straighten them out. Uh, so these were the people who were going into the jungle to straighten out the bent timber of humanity. Machines directed by enlightened controllers would go into the forest and straighten out the human timber. Now, the perfectibilist, perfectibilist discourse goes like this. Science identified God with nature and set out to discover the laws of nature. The laws of nature, in turn, linked physics with technology. By the 18th century, it was widely believed that social phenomena, too, were subject to natural laws. As Heidegger recognized, when nature becomes an object of research, when nature becomes an object of research, humans become objects of research. Thus, the social sciences were the offspring of the natural sciences, and social scientists would increasingly see themselves as social engineers, as indeed do economists. They are part of the social sciences. Economists always regard themselves as the queen of the social sciences because of their ability to quantify. Um, but they're part of this perfectibilist, um, perfectibilist um, project. In fact, economics language is saturated with perfectibilist projects. Just think of the importance of optimal. Um, there grew up then, um, among this, so these social engineering classes, an attitude of detachment from one's own culture and criticism of it by a universal standard given by nature, which Enlightenment thinkers believed would lead to the discovery of universal laws valid at all times. So the decisive pushes, right, towards Newtonizing society, if you might call it that, were given by Newton himself. Voltaire um, wondered why the exact laws that you, Newton had discovered for the movement of the planets shouldn't be applied to the movement of societies. 
have any of you come across Condorcet's sketch for a historical picture of the progress of the human mind? He was an 18th century philosopher. And um, he, uh, he's interesting because he states this belief in its almost unqualified form. He set out to show, and I'm quoting, by appeal to reason and fact, that nature has set no limit to the perfection of human faculties, that the perfectibility of man is truly indefinite, and that the progress of this perfectibility from now onwards, independent of any power which might wish to halt it, will never be reversed. But then he adds an interesting qualification. As long as the general laws of this system produce neither a general cataclysm or such changes as will deprive the human race of its present faculties and its present resources. So there was a qualification there, but he didn't make much of it. We now think of this qualification in rather more urgent terms. Condorcet had an interesting, he, he, he was very far-sighted, but at the same time completely insane. Um, uh, he, for example, believed that knowledge of statistical probabilities would replace irrational by rational choices, a belief faithfully upheld by mainstream e economists to this day. That's why they study econometrics. Um, I mean, uh, he, uh, and, and, and you know, um, Condorcet didn't have the calculus yet, but he had an idea of the calculus, and he thought it would be especially useful to work out credit ratings. Um, and, uh, I mean, credit ratings, he, he, saw, he saw that in, in, in 1794. He saw credit ratings. And what about social credit ratings? which they've introduced in China, of course. Um, so all this was all in, within his, um, w within his uh, vision, but he thought it could be done quickly. Quickly, he should have known better. He wrote this book a few months before he was executed by the French Revolution. I mean, they don't, they're not sure whether he was executed, but he died of poisoning. Um, but so, you know, he didn't foresee that the attempt to introduce that kind of society was going to lead to horrors which he'd never dreamt of. Um, so, um, well, Condorcet was an optimist. The optimists weren't wrong um, to see plentiful evidence of human possibility as well as uh, evil in, in the human performance to date, and they were right to sense a general forward movement um, in their own time. But their materialist conception of the mind blinded them to the spiritual, psychic, and social strains and tensions inherent in their own agenda. The belief that time's arrow pointed unproblematically to a future of peace and plenty was just as much an act of faith as any religious dogma. In fact, as we know, um, implemented projects to strengthen the crooked timber of humanity, projects that were implemented in the Soviet Union, in Hitler's Germany, these were, you know, these were murderous. Uh, and, and they were bound to be. It's not that perfection is murderous, it's the, it, it's the desire to get a perfect society, whether it's a perfect soci a society without any classes or whether it's society with only one race. These are um, murderous schemes inherently. And none of these 18th century uh, optimists really realize that. <coughs> so, let me turn to another aspect, a very crucial, related aspect of this perf perfectibility discourse. Does digital technology enhance the freedom of humans, or does it enhance the power to control humans? We're now talking about our own technology. Um, in the past, all tyrannies um, were inefficient, uh, partly because no government had the power to keep its citizens under constant watch. This isn't true today. So is technology divine or devilish? 
early champions of the internet um, envisaged its potential in starkly utopian terms. Today's techno enthusiasts are heirs of the California or Wired technology, ideology, named after Wired magazine. The Wired ideology fused the cultural bohemianism of San Francisco with the high-tech entrepreneurialism of Silicon Valley, presenting technology as a panacea that would liberate humanity from all that ails it. In, in the minds of the Valley's libertarian tech pioneers, technology is seen as the force liberating humans, not just from work, but from the imperfections of human life itself. Wired made computers cool. Um, the fast-paced journalistic style of the magazine, I don't know whether any of you have, have read any of Wired. I mean, it's, it's where I get some of these, you know, the, these ideas of what they were thinking from. It, 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 the journalism, the magazine covered the latest computer uh, uh, culture, contemporary pop culture, all manner of digital gadgetry. It broke down the popular image of the computer user, user as a supreme specialist or scientific military technician. When Wired arrived on the scene, widely available, affordable, and easy to use personal computers were beginning to explode into the United States and British markets. In the magazine's pages, computer nerds, tech wizards, programmers, were all of a sudden imbued with a kind of cultural capital that had hitherto been reserved for pop stars and celebrities. Well, we know their names. <clears throat> In his book, From Counterculture to Cyberculture, Fred Turner notes the links, both material and spiritual, between this new generation of digital utopians and the radical traditions of the 1960s counterculture. Both eulogized a kind of anarchic uh, vision of human freedom. Uh, for many of the 1960s radicals, this meant living communally, sharing, uh, sharing um, sex, um, using conscious expanding drugs, and taking uh, an equal share in the running of the community. Um, in the, in, for the wired generation, it meant accessing information and contributing to the vast digital network with total ease. For Mark Fisher, who's a very important cultural critic, um, the 1960s and 1970s were the acid moment, the moment when social and economic conditions plus popular music and drugs enabled an unprecedented expansion of consciousness. So, that's the, that's the, um, uh, that's, that was the mood. Um, but, you know, this utopian view of internet as liberating, removing intermediaries, removing all intermediaries between knowledge and the individual, all those gatekeepers would be gone. And, and you know, you, you'd have direct communication with, 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 um, with um, God, the God of the internet. But it depended on there being an absence of fixed, discernible power. In fact, two sources of power remain highly concrete and visible. The state and the private corporation. It's easy to forget the extent of the power that governments and regulators exert over what we see online. This is most visibly, uh, of course, in, in, in instantiated in what has come to be known as China's Great Firewall. A state censorship project, project of gargantuan proportions that both blocks online content and monitors users' individual activity on the web. The firewall is part of the Chinese government's Golden Shield project, through which Chinese officials have also sought to produce an enormous electronic database, including speech and face recognition, CCTV, and credit records, and combine this with traditional data about individuals' internet use. In the hands of Chinese officials, information is a means by which state power can be exercised 
and extended. And that's always a potential. That's always a potential of this technology, sure. But we don't need to look as far as East Asia, for example, of governments seeking to police information flows online. The, the American military's Information Awareness Office, IAO, was established in 2002 in the wake of the 9-11 attacks with the intention of using digital technology to extract and store vast quantities of personal data on everyone in the United States. Tellingly, it has as its mo motto, scientia est potentia, knowledge is power. The Orwellian scale of the various parallel intelligence programs run both by the US Defense Advanced Research Project Agency and the UK's government communication headquarters in the name of counterterrorism is startling. And, you know, an article I read in the New York Times recently about um, uh, IAO's surveillance projects. Um, it sought to, I'm quoting, construct a computer system that could create a vast electronic dragnet searching for personal information as part of the hunt for terrorists around the world. And the system is ominously named Total Information Awareness. It would provide intelligence analysts and law enforcement officials with instant access to information from internet mail and calling, credit, uh, calling records to credit cards and banking transactions and travel documents without a search warrant. The IAO's director, Admiral Pointexter, said that government needs broad new tools, tools, he said, to process, store, and mine billions of minute de details of electronic life in the United States. Um, well, now we turn to the other very visible presence, my last visible presence, which is capitalism, and particularly the, cap the big platforms that are now um, in, in, in total value, are the largest, uh, largest um, holders of wealth among all businesses in the world, things like Google, Facebook. Here, here's something from Murmur a novel by William Eaves, I think it's rather interesting, it was published in 2018, in which a fictionalized Alan Turing, do you, do you know who Alan Turing was? He was the great British cryptographer, and he devised something called the Turing test, which was supposed to be able to distinguish a robot from a human being. But anyway, Alan Turing is still alive in this fictionalized um, novel, and he records a, a, a conversation um, overheard at a party. A, a young marketing executive explains that, and I'm quoting, research shows that the future lies in neuro, neuromarketing. Neuromarketing. It won't be long before we can map feelings. All human feelings are causable and programmable if we can find which areas of the brain respond to purchase pleasure then we can increase your brand awareness, stimulate your brain to be much more aware of those specific purchases and brands which give you pleasure. Well, then a biologist joins the conversation and says, the point of what you um, uh, do is not to get at what humans, uh, what's human about mental processes, says the biologist, or what it is to feel, but to reduce the definition of being human to a data set that can be used to write proprietary algorithms that will tell us what you think we'd like you to buy. The data hasn't got to be remotely accurate. It just has to be everywhere. And then, when it's everywhere and used by everyone, it will be right. So you don't even have to find out what humans want to purchase in order to sell them. You just have to actually reduce their consciousness to the point at which they will actually follow the instructions of the algorithm. <coughs> and so the, the, the big uh, theorist of, uh, of uh, surveillance capitalism is um, uh, Professor uh, Shoshana Zuboff, who, who wrote a book 
called surveillance capital, capitalism um, a few, a few, a few um, years ago. And, and I just quote one thing. The techniques of surveillance capitalism combine big data, machine learning, commercially available predictions of user behavior, markets in future behavior, behavioral nudges, and careful structuring of, structuring of choice architecture to, share, to steer human activity in the desired direction. A new economic order that claims human experience as free raw material for hidden commercial practices of extraction, prediction, and sales. And of course, what Zuboff's also noticed is a symbiotic um, relationship shared by systems of state and private sector surveillance because the state also gets information from the, the platforms. Um, so, uh, you know, um, here again you have this debate. I mean, the platforms depend, defend um, their uh, position um, on grounds that um, um, they are enhancing consumer choice. Where have you heard that before? Is it by any chance in an economics textbook? Um, consumer choice, consumer sovereignty is there. There's no, nothing interferes with it. You, you know, you just click on and, and that's it. You know, you can get so much more than you could have got before. Um, the more information we have, the more informed our choices will be. Um, but although the mechanism of control under surveillance capitalism may appear to operate in a far more diffuse manner than it does within, within projects of top-down state surveillance, well, you, you have to think, you have to argue um, uh, whether you, you agree with that. Now, I've come to my conclusion. I'm sorry, I've gone on a little bit long, but... Uh, there's not much more to come. I just um, want to define finally my own attitude to all this. P possibly it's emerged from what I've been saying. But it's not that easy because the two discourses, the automation discourse and the perfectibility discourse, are, uh, you know, are sort of interrelated. And nevertheless, there is a difference I want to maintain between um, spillover effects of using machines and the deliberate attempts to use technological systems to shape humans into a desired shape. Uh, both, one could say, threaten extinction, but it's extinction of a different, different kinds. One would extinguish humans physically if it carried to extremes, and the other would distinguish what it means to be human. So I think um, uh, you're, 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 those, those are the two worst case scenarios. As concerns the automation discourse, I'm clear that the aim should be to slow down the pace of technical change to the point at which humans can adapt to it fairly seamlessly and when it doesn't threaten the planet and, and therefore the human race with extinction. I mean, our climate change crisis is the result of technology. Of course it is. We wouldn't have had so many people in the world without technology and we wouldn't have been emitting so much um, so much CO2. I mean, it's obvious. But all, all, all anyone can say is, well, we need better technology now in order to overcome the bad technology or the out-of-control technology that's caused our, our extinction uh, problem. Um, well, I'm very much in favor of... Uh, of uh, any initiative now being taken to control um, uh, the rate of climate change. Um, but I don't know that people realize, people who met in Glasgow um, last week realize that, um, you know, what, what difference it would make, what radical changes we would have to make to the way we live. I mean, for example, just take distribution. Joe Stiglitz calculated in 2008 that if a 48 trillion uh, uh, global, uh, dollar global economy were divided equally among everyone in the world, everyone, um, a family of four, would receive um, $28,000 if it were divided equally. In 2018, we have an eight, 85 trillion 
a dollar global economy, and 7.5 billion people. Um, uh, but the world would still produce enough to allow um, $45,000 each for a family of four. That's Joe Stiglitz's calculation. Huh. There's enough to go round, in other words. We don't have to grow anymore. There's enough to grow, go round as if things are. But having said that, I realize the political impossibility of achieving the, the global wealth tax suggested by Thomas Piketty and the huge difficulty in reining in the deeply ingrained habits of consumption and consumerism produced by technology itself. So while we applaud the targets, um, um, uh, and, and, and you know, uh, uh, I doubt if leaders have, have begun to recognize uh, the extent of readjustment which will be required uh, to, to achieve them. So, the, the best bet is that they won't achieve their targets. I don't think anyone really thinks they're going to achieve their targets. They hope to get as near to them as they possibly can, which means that global temperatures will rise uh, to 2% or more instead of being limited to 1.5%, which means that there will be more extreme weather events. Um, that's if you take the science. I'm taking the science as given here. Now, I'm, you may want to query it, but I take it as given. If you take it as given and take their projections as given, there will be more extreme climate events year by year as we approach, uh, as we go through the century. Now, what about the perfectibility discourse? This points to another uh, kind of extinction, the extinction of the human species as we know it. Um, <laughs> And that's the meaning of the drive for artificial intelligence, really. What Simon Head in his book called Digital Taylorism. Uh, making uh, people contented slaves, as Aldous Huxley argued, are the means to control them. When I read um, that facial and biometric recognition technologies are being rolled, rolled into schools, um, facial and bi biometrical recognition technology. I know that the real purpose isn't to protect the children against terrorists or the teachers, it's to control what goes on in these buildings. And, and that, that's always, that's always the, the, the motive you have to look at. Um, just like Bentham's panopticon, under cover of medical improvements, the ultimate goal of cybernetics is to replace humans by cyborgs. And that thought makes me Dostoevskian. How then to escape from the perfectibilist trap? In the 1960s, I was greatly influenced by the Dutch writer Robert Persig and um, his wonderful philosophic novel, um, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. I, I, it was, a, it was, a, it was a, one of the books I read when I was a lot younger. It was published at the tail end of the counter-cultural counter anti-Vietnam protests in the United States. Persig wrote about the movement as he saw it going on around him. You get the illusion of a mass movement, an anti-technological mass movement, an entire political anti-technological left emerging, looming up from apparently nowhere, saying stop the technology, have it somewhere else, don't have it here. Well, I wish I could, you know, recapture the exhilaration of that moment, but it seems obvious you can't. You can't stop the technology. You can't have it somewhere else. It's everywhere. They thought in those hippie communities you could have it somewhere else, but of course even they couldn't have it somewhere else. But now you certainly can't have it somewhere else. But it seems obvious to me that it's crucially important to restore some kind of balance between humans and machines such that ordinary humans are at all times reliably in control of how much, what kind of machinery they want to use in managing their, 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 their lives, their, their work, and, and their social relations and, and managing the planet above everything else. There are initiatives from above, there are popular movements like XR from below, a top group of scientists has called global warming a wake-up call, the doomsday clock group. But, but do we really understand what waking up means? 
to our standards of living, uh, to travel, to all the machinery which satisfies our wants at the price of controlling our lives. Not yet, but perhaps the time will come. Now, I want to introduce a really um, nice economic concept in my last paragraph that I got from Albert Hirschman. The economist, he said, had, he, he had the idea, intriguing idea, of the optimal crisis. Deep enough to provoke change, but not so deep that it wiped out the means to make it. The optimal crisis. It's a wonderful idea. Um, thus, necessities would be converted into virtues. And I think we have to hope, um, we, 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 we have to think of the future in that way, uh, that our lot will be progress through catastrophe, indeed, as it's always been, um, but that the catastrophes are optimal. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much for a very inspiring but also a little bit scary uh, lecture. I'm not sure that everybody will sleep well tonight. <laughs> um, so, so I do hope you can provide us with some guidelines on, um, let's say, defensive lines or uh, solutions that are better than optimal crisis. <laughs> but perhaps uh, before you get to that, uh, I would like to invite the floor for any questions. Please stand Hi. up and say your name and then ask your question. I have to say my name as well. Wow. <laughs> uh, my name is Uga. Hi. Uh, I enjoyed the lecture very much. Especially, I like the part about the surveillance capitalism. And so my question is, what do you think would be a way to sort of limit or reduce our movement towards um, surveillance capitalism in a political sense, like through regulations or maybe political strategy? Yeah, thank you. Well, I think the, you know, the classic liberal answer is to break up. It's, it's trust busting, really. Um, if you can, um, if you can uh, um, break up these very big global platforms into smaller units, uh, then you um, destroy their power answer. Uh, the, the problem is um, starter advantages. They're huge, immense. They've already got so much data. It's very hard to, uh, for a new platform to come in with, with um, uh, so little data and then try and fight the, 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 the very big, that's, that's one problem. The second is that if you break up these um, uh, big, big platforms, then you increase the power of the state. Because, you know, like you have in China, you, they, they, they simply don't allow certain, certain uh, platforms in and they control their own. So, just have to click off, not use them as much. I mean, I, I, I think it's going to be difficult. That's why, that's why I believe that you have to have some more experience of E.M. Forster, um, the novel, The Machine Stops. Um, we have to have more outings. Um, and then we start getting alarmed. You see, I don't think, I don't think it is a, a Boris Johnson uh, in, in, in Glasgow talked about a warlike situation we face. But it's not a warlike situation. We don't really believe we're at war. Where is the evidence of the war? It's not like 1940. Um, so I think using war analogies um, are uh, useless, actually. Um, you, don't have, you haven't got that emotional response that you do have to an uh, existential crisis because the crisis hasn't happened. That's why I'm sort of quite attracted by the idea of the optimal crisis, but it's very difficult to arrange the optimal. <laughs> Annalise? Um. No. Uh, yeah, I'm a bit deaf, but if you speak up, I'll, <laughs> I'll be okay. My name is uh, Annalise. Um, do you have an example of an optimum crisis in the past? What is your most optimal crisis? 
what is the most optimal crisis or yeah what ha what has happened in the past that for you was the most optimal crisis ever? Um, well um good good question good question um can one think of crises that have been um okay um it, you can't say it's um exactly optimal but it came closer to being optimal than some others. I'm, I'm sure we can all think of more example. I mean, something like a big depression, economic depression. Um, that doesn't kill people necessarily. Um, you get a lot of unemployment, but it spurs people to think. I'm thinking of the American Depression and Roosevelt's New Deal. I mean, that was a response to a non-lethal crisis. It was pretty catastrophic, and I don't think it was optimal, um, really, but it was more optimal than the Second World War, which also produced huge social progress. I mean, without the Second World War and its horrors, there would not have been a European Union. There would not have been a modern welfare state. There would not have been a full employment policy for 25 years. Now, this is a huge, huge problem in f thinking philosophically about the future and also in literary terms because it sort of almost suggests that, you know, the devil has, a, has a, an active role to play in the improvement of humans, which, of course, was the whole theme of Faust, Goethe's Faust. But uh, it's very... You can't actually wish for a horrible disaster in order to get an improved welfare state. You see what I mean? Um, so I think this idea of the optimal, <laughs> the optimal crisis, what is, is, is a very tricky one, but it, it, it's an interesting one to play with because, because otherwise, if they're very severely suboptimal crises, you won't have a chance of restoring um, uh, or improving. Many uh, dystopian novels assume a non-optimal crisis. I mean, there are two sorts, really. One is that the existing world is wiped out by a nuclear disaster. The other sort that it, is that it's wiped out by an ecological catastrophe. Those are the two staples of dystopian novels in the 20th century. What survives are a few savages that somehow manage to, you know, keep some existence going, and then you have to recuperate all over again, and, you know, the cycle starts up. That, that's the sort of, that's the dystopian imagination. And you might say, well, this is all, you know, why should we pay any attention to literature? Well, we should. <coughs> can, can I follow up by, by playing the devil's advocate? So, yeah, of course. So shouldn't, um, so is it, isn't it likely that in the technological age that we are in, any crisis will be responded to by looking for more technological solutions so that uh, an optimal crisis at the least should discredit technology? <laughs> well, you know, um, one of my colleagues in, 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 uh, on a committee I sit um, in, in Parliament is um, someone called Nick Stern. And Nick Stern produced a very influential report, the Stern Report, as you know. Um, now, he thought you could do everything you needed to without a crisis. He had a, he had a model which told him what, had, what you had to do. Um, and it was fine. But when I sort of um, say, look, you know, you, you really didn't get it right, he says, no, I got it right. It's the politicians who got it wrong. They wouldn't do what was required. And, you know, the trouble with economics, uh, I mean, obviously every discipline has to have some frontier. And, uh, you know, I'm not, I don't criticize Nick. He's a very good friend. It we, has to have some frontier. But then to, it's, the danger is you pass the buck to someone else and you say it's their fault that we haven't had the, the, the optimal policies. That, that were recommended. The question is, should you have recommended anything like the optimal policies to start with? Should you not have recommended policies that were more feasible, perhaps? Um, or should you have had more sensitivity to the political realities 
Um, I don't know the answer to that. I, I, I struggle with that. I mean, I, 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 you see, I'm not a model builder myself. I don't build models. Economics is about building models. It didn't used to be, but it is now. Okay, um, I wanted to ask whether from your experience as an economist and more so as a politician, uh, do you believe that uh, we can still avert a severe uh, climate crisis under the current system? Could you uh, um, uh, give, give me the, the gist of that question, please? The question, because I didn't Sorry. hear it properly. Should it's I repeat? it's my fault, you not repeat? yours. Can you repeat? Yeah, uh, it's now okay? Yeah. All right. Uh, from your experience as an economist and more so a politician, do you believe we can still avert a severe climate crisis under the current system? As an econo economist and as a politician, do I believe... Can you fight it? Can the climate crisis. Can you overcome the climate crisis? No. No. As I, as, as I said, as I said, um, the temperatures will just rise. Um, Ah, in the current system, well, you um, probably not in, well, okay, I want, to, I want to throw the question back at you then. Under what system do you think there'd be a chance? Or let's say system, under what conditions? Um, well, idealistically, probably uh, a world government of sorts. Okay, world government. Yeah, I okay. I agree. I agree. If we had a world government, um, a preferably a dictatorial world government with the right ideas, we could probably force people to adapt uh, their lives to the requirements of ecological security, probably. Um, but um, all these things are going to happen in the next 20 or 30 years. Are we going to have a dictatorial world government by then? You see, men, much of the damage is going to be done in the next 20 or 30 years. Um, and that is without, if everything is backloaded in the way it, it looks likely, it's going to be India, for example, China, um, a lot of the damage will be done and the, and the, and the crises will be there. I mean, um, uh, they, they won't be, they won't eliminate the world. Of course they would. They'll make bits of the world uninhabitable um, and that will um, provoke a massive migration movement from China into Siberia, which will become maybe much warmer, and from Africa and the Middle East to Europe. So, uh, yeah. Um, Tell me I'm wrong, and I'll withdraw. I think we move to the next question. <laughs> I hope the science is wrong. I hope the science is too pessimistic. But coming back to your um, to your <coughs> proposal of the optimal crisis, this was because you are very critical of technology having deliberate deliberate efforts to use mechanism as a mechanism to, to influence human behavior. That's what you're very critical of. It's difficult to hear here in the back. I don't think people can hear you. So Sorry. Well. Okay. You're very critical of deliberate efforts to use technology uh, to influence human behavior, essentially. And this is why you kind of ask for an optimal crisis. Uh, I immediately thought myself being a sixth year of sabotage, that should be a very interesting route, but, and I would like to, to think about the optimal sabotage, but that's a different story maybe, maybe not. But you cannot deny that you always will use technology to influence human behavior, I think. So you cannot stop that. No. And you kind of suggested don't use Facebook or something like that, but that will not prevent us from being influenced by technology in our human behavior. So. Isn't the question how to regulate that better than we can do now? Isn't that the question we should ask ourselves and look how we can, in how we can invoke regulations to do this better? 
and maybe your optimal crisis should mo should provoke that kind of thinking, isn't that? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think you've got to aim for a sort of kind of equilibrium here. Of course, I mean, we 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 talk about social conditioning. I mean, no one denies that social conditioning has been. Um, going on since the beginning of human society. I mean, we've been conditioned by our environment, by our climate, by the, by church, by government, um, uh, uh, by private uh, uh, organisations. Always there are shaping forces going on. But you, um, and that's why we. That's why liberalism really became finally um, a, a, a dominant uh, political. Uh, philosophy because it tried to hold a balance between the different kinds of persuade different persuaders to allow human freedom a space uh, to flourish what I'm saying is that this balance is being eroded by the uncontrollable forward momentum of technology which is much more intrusive and more um, um, more uh, uh, controlling in its potential than previous technology. And there's a forward dynamism. I mean, digital technology is the one that we probably need to, to focus on. So the constitutional balance, which sort of protected individual um, freedom, um, is, is, is gone or is going. And then you have naked left individuals because they're organizations are being eroded individuals and the knowledge um, the knowledge providers just no, nothing in between uh, look at look at the decay of political parties I mean political parties were very important in structuring um, divisions in society uh, and, and, and achieving balances between different views they're, they're eroded they've become you know I don't know electoral um, uh, plebiscitary, more and more plebis plebiscitary um, sort of types of democracy. So that's all I'm saying. Now, when you say regulated, okay, okay, um, then that's regulated. But um, what do you do? You have laws to protect privacy. Fine. Um, if, you, if, if you have really serious laws to protect privacy of information, you would destroy the platforms and that's why they were, won't allow it. Because they, um, their profits ba are based on non-privacy. You might try and think of different financing schemes for access to um, information on the internet. Um, you um, want to police fake news or do you what is fake news what is the difference between fake news and non-fake news is the world doesn't the world have some conspiracies going around we all believe in conspiracy theory up to a point it's when we believe it insanely that um uh, uh we we um we, we, we go mad. Has anyone read Ursula Le Guin's um, Oryx and Crace? It's a great novel. Anyone read it? Do I mean Ursula Le Guin? No, I mean, I mean not Ursula Le Guin. I mean, uh, what? Margaret Atwood. Margaret Atwood. You're quite right. Sorry, you're right. Have you read it? Yes. Yeah, well, you, you know the plot, or one of the plots. It's sort of very... Anyway, this doctor, he's working for a you know, um, a sort of tech, high-tech company, and they've, they've developed a drug. And this drug, or it's a, it's a super vitamin, which will make everyone incredibly healthy. Um, and tell me if I've got the plot wrong. Uh, and, and anyway, the, then someone says to the company, but look, if everyone becomes very, very help, healthy, there'll be no, uh, that will destroy the pharmacological industry, the uh, pharmaceutical industry. It'll there won't be any more need for, for doctors. So what they do is they put into this super um, uh, drug some random virus, ran which people sort of, you know, um, sort of uh, enough people take. And, and 
basically, I mean, ends up the whole human race is is, is sort of uh, uh, is destroyed. This is uh, this is the far far pharmace pharmaceutical disaster, um, and they're left a few superior people whom you know a small number who who maybe are the per per have been perfected. Am I roughly right? Okay. I think that's, that's it for regulation. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I have at least uh, two people. Sorry, the point, the point of bringing that is, we, you know, when we think of conspiracy theories, we say, but this couldn't happen now. We couldn't ever have uh, something put on the market which actually causes diseases it's meant to cure, could we? No, not if we're sane, yet most people in Russia seem to believe that. They won't get vaccinated. There's one question here, and then there, and I think then we have to stop, and then any other question will have to be asked during the drinks afterwards, so then you have to take your chances there. Try to keep your questions short and concise. And stay in the okay, very short question, and then uh, maybe a little follow-up remark, but I, I would definitely uh, advise you um, to use this uh, this optimal crisis in the last chapter. So the optimal crisis, I think, for me, would mean it, it, it's a crisis that sparks a gale of creative destruction. And then okay. I hope you know where I'm going. Okay. Okay. I'm missing I'm missing in the whole story the whole idea of an open society, of an open-ended future, uh, and Schumpeter's work on evolutionary economics. Can you <laughs> comment on that? Reluctantly give up the mic. <laughs> um, yeah, I heard that. Um, Creative destruction is 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 uh, absolutely um, uh, a possible wa way. I mean, um, I mean, either Schumpeterian. Look, Schumpeter comes from Central Europe. Central Europe is Faustian. I mean, they 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 know all about um, the the role. I mean, if 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 you th if you if you are in from Central Europe, Germany, Austria. You always think dialectically. That seems to be the a central um, philosophic tradition. Marx, I mean, Marx got it from Hegel, but of course, um, uh, Schumpeter uh, thinks in exactly the same way. You have to have destruction in order to have creation. Now, the point is always how much destruction how does Schumpeter want to control it? I mean, he doesn't. He says, you've got to allow enterprise to create uh, the wealth, but it'll do it in this kind of private enterprise, but it'll do it in this kind of way. And there's a long run equilibrium somewhere in the system that he doesn't quite sort of ever um, get there. It's, as you say, open-ended. The trouble is how much destruction uh, a, is it just to inflict on people for the sake of the creation? And B, um, how do you know what the outcomes are going to be? In the past, you can say out of the welter of disruption, destruction, and everything else came our marvelous capitalist civilization. And we had to pay the price for it, the necessary price. <sighs> yeah, well, um, I think you have to make up your mind about that. Um, but um, uh, I don't know whether Schumpeter, he certainly didn't have an idea of optimal um, in the back of his mind. I mean, I, sorry, this is another subject almost. Schumpeter wanted to believe in I, equilibrium, I think I, I but he couldn't. I have to control couldn't. you as well as him. So. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay. You can drink. You can just. Okay. You stay for drinks. Final question there. Um. First, I want to say uh, uh, advertisement is a kind of uh, fake news. I can't hear a word. Yes? Okay. Advertisement is a kind of fake news. Uh, after the Second World War, we uh, defeated fascism and we defended ourselves against communism. These are two collective kind of ideology, ideologies, yes. We choose for liberalism and say uh, to us the individual is important, but then we don't left free choice to the 
uh, individual, but we put advertisement on him and her so that we manipulate what they want. So, and, um, well, yes, uh, to me that's a kind of problem. It's not only technology what is the problem, it's also the problem that we, uh, uh, that, that we, uh, 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 no, I don't, uh, advertisement is also a problem. Okay. In, in a liberal economy, we, uh, we, so we choose liberal economy for individual choice, but then we allow advertisement and marketing as a sort of fake news to influence it. And that's the, that's the problem that he wants you to address. Yeah, well, it, it's, 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 not a, it's not a new problem. Um, right from the beginning, the doctrine of consumer sovereignty was attacked on grounds of unrealism. Um, I think one of the most famous assaults um, of the later 20th century was led by uh, Galbraith in the, in, the, in the United States. Before, before any of the computer technology, he said, you know, wants are, being manu wants are manufactured in order to keep the industrial machine going. And that is not, of course, um, uh, when you think of it, it's obvious. In fact, advertisers undoubtedly have always said this and, and known, known it. The, 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 um, uh, the, the first person, person who started marketing in the in, uh, marketing industry in America said, look, our job is to make people want things they never realized they wanted before. I mean, so, I mean, that has always been, that has always been true. I mean, my point was that the, that the um, um, uh, digital technology, internet technology, means that your advertising is much more successful than it was before because you can now target individuals in a way you weren't able to. You could target groups, um, you could target, and when, when you were targeting groups, they sort of knew they were being targeted in a way. I mean, you know, you were, you were, you know, the ads, ads appeared in front of your eyes. Um, and, and, um, and, and, and you, you, but here, what, what's happening is that they know what your tastes are, or they think they know what your tastes are, or as this uh, person in uh, the novel said, you don't even, they don't even need to know what your tastes are. They have to just persuade you that everyone else has the same taste and then you buy, buy this stuff, whether, you, whether that's your taste or not. So the tools have become much more powerful, but that also means the tools of government persuasion have become much more powerful as well. Um, I, I think I have to put a stop to the discussion. Um, so this, this brings an end to a wonderful evening. Um, I think we had a fascinating lecture and a fascinating discussion that I assume can go on for a long time uh, if we don't stop. Um, and we are going to stop, but we will have drinks uh, just uh, out of uh, this uh, hall in uh, Ad Fundum, and there everybody who wants to can keep discussing it with one another and potentially if the queue is not too long also with uh, Robert Skidelsky. So uh, thank you again, uh, Professor Skidelsky, for a great uh, evening that you made for us. And thanks the audience for having a very good question round and a good discussion. Uh, get home safely, and we hope to see you soon for another event. Thank you. <laughs>